Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Metro Detroit in the national spotlight as President Biden tours Ford's electric vehicle plant in Dearborn. With the president in town, Jewish and Arab Americans are reacting to the conflict in the Middle East, what both sides have to say. But first, an immigrant who sought refuge with his family inside a Detroit church takes his first steps outside. Topping our news at six, Dead Rans Borgai and his uh, wife Flora came from the U.S. from Albania 20 years ago seeking asylum. They spent years here, but in 2018, ICE agents began aggressively seeking out undocumented immigrants and deporting them. That's when Dead and Flora and their two sons took refuge in the church. After a three-year deportation battle, Dead was finally allowed to leave. Victor Williams joins us, and Victor, it was an emotional day. Yes, quite emotional. Believe it or not, it had been multiple years since this man had stepped foot outside of the church. Finally, he's able to do so, hopefully a glimpse of his future in the, to come. Now I get the fresh air, man, after three years and a half. It's, I can't believe myself either. Today we have good news. For years, Dead Aransbergai has been confined to the walls of Central United Methodist Church in downtown Detroit. And for the first time, he's able to leave. Today, right now, just sound like free man. <laughs> After three years and a half. Because I'm free man, I got all the people with me. While in sanctuary, Dead was facing several consequences if he ever decided to unlawfully leave the building, including being arrested and deported. Thankfully, he had his wife Flora every step of the way. Sadly, she's been fighting a battle with multiple sclerosis the whole time. I can go outside with my wife and her come from home. Church officials now hoping for change in the overall immigration system. This is indeed a day of celebration for the Ranks Bergai family. But to be honest, it is a day that did not have to happen. It is the result of this nation's broken, inhumane, and just plain cruel immigration system. And even though this is only the beginning in Dead's return to the outside world, at least it gives hope to the immigrant who is now able to see his two sons. And all the people in here, thank you and God bless you all. I'm so happy for myself and you people what you do for us. Very good ending. Now, even though this is a very big milestone, the church as well as other lawyers are not stopping their fight for immigration reform. Victor Williams, Local 4. So, uh, Victor, I'm, I'm wondering, what's the first thing Dead plans to do with his newly found freedom here? Well, the first thing he wants to do is grab his driver's license and then take a drive around, hopefully returning back to Norris. Okay. Victor, thanks. Now to President Biden, looking at the landscape coming out of a pandemic, worried about climate change, but seeing in all of it, opportunity. The president paying a visit to Ford's Rouge electric vehicle facility in Dearborn. Reminiscent of the auto bailout, he wants the federal government to plow millions into electric vehicles. And he says China is the country to beat. Local 4 business editor Rob Maloney live in Dearborn with more on a big day there. Rod. Yeah, Devin, this is kind of like the space race. The president sees a threat. China owning uh, much of the infrastructure, the mineral rights to be able to make batteries. They make 80% of the electric batteries in the world. And he says, we need to catch up with that. But he also sees possibility in the federal government coming to the rescue. Right now, China is leading in this race. Make no bones about it. It's a fact. You know, we used to invest more in research and development than any country in the world. The president came to the F-150 plant to see and ride in the new electric F-150 Lightning. And while it was all smiles out on the track, inside he discussed an existential threat. China, the number one R&D country in the world. We now are number eight and China's number one. Can't let that be sustained. The president wants billions in federal dollars poured into auto electrification, charging stations, new buses, and other transportation, claiming it will create thousands of new technology jobs. And they think they're going to win. But I got news for them. They will not win this race. We can't let them. But this is a massive scale project. Does it make any sense? We asked renowned Michigan economist Patrick Anderson. 
putting the government in charge of that transition is very risky. Uh, the government is not has a very good track record of picking winners and losers. He says China's trying to be like us and we should not be looking to beat them. Instead, he said, get the technology right before forcing the issue. Now he points to the fact that in the first quarter of this year, 97% of the vehicles purchased in this country were internal combustion engine vehicles. Only 3% were electric vehicles. He says right now, the technology isn't there. It's more expensive, not enough charging stations. And for the average American, it's too expensive. He says, we need to tap the brakes on this plan. Back to you. Well, Rod, where, where, any guess on where this goes from here? Well, it has to go through Congress, Devin. Yep. The Republicans were out today saying that the president was putting a wrecking ball to the economy anyway, and they feel that this is not the best answer. So they have to negotiate this thing. The president talked about wanting to get to a bipartisan agreement on this thing. We'll see where the American Jobs Plan ends up. All right, Rod. Well, several miles away, it was a very different scene outside Dearborn Police Headquarters. Protesters took to the streets this afternoon as the conflict in the Middle East continues to evolve. Let's get out to Priya Mann. She's live in Dearborn tonight. Priya, you spoke with both Muslim and Jewish leaders. Yeah, that's right. And Kim, Devin, you know, there's a lot of Arab and Jewish families here in Metro Detroit with loved ones back in the Middle East. Today, there was a large protest outside of Dearborn Police Headquarters, and some of Metro Detroit's youngest voices were taking a stand. I feel good that I'm protesting. Why? Because I like helping people out. One of the youngest demonstrators in Dearborn, just nine years old. It's very sad, and it's not supposed to happen like that. Thousands of protesters, many Arab American, took to the streets Tuesday during President Biden's visit to the Ford Rouge plant in Dearborn. In Metro Detroit, Arab and Jewish families are watching developments unfold halfway across the world. I think on any side, no one is watching TV and going, hooray, someone was killed. We're, everybody is just watching this with sadness. Diana Kutob's childhood home is in Sheikh Jarrah, a tiny neighborhood in East Jerusalem at the center of rising tensions. I am so upset and I cry every day. Diana says her family was forced to leave their home and she fears others will have to do the same. I lived in this house and now I have no memory. They took over. As violence escalates in the Middle East, many across Metro Detroit are hoping for a peaceful resolution. We might not agree on everything, but we are neighbors, we're brothers and sisters. And that's really what we all need to remember right now. And during President Biden's speech, he only made one comment about the rising tensions in the Middle East, praising Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Folks here said they helped elect President Biden and they're not happy with his administration's response. Reporting live in Dearborn tonight, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Certainly more to come on this. Okay, Priya, thank you. Let's get our check of the weather now. Yeah, Ben joins us with a look at what we can expect for tonight and the week ahead. Hi, Ben. Hi, guys. Yeah, uh, just a whole lot more sweat. I think that's the best way to put it. Although right now it's really pleasant outside with that 75 degree temperature. But this is going to turn into 80s real quick. In fact, that's pretty much all we've got going forward from here. Rest of the evening, few clouds around, temperature 70s, 60s, low humidity, light winds, generally just a beautiful finish. Uh, to the day, but as we go forward into the next few, that's when we really start to see that mercury crank up. It is going to feel like July this weekend, and we're going to be a lot closer to records than normals. So we'll look at those numbers, but we can already start to see the next cool down coming. So we'll track that and find out exactly when it shows up. Local Forecasters app, of course, has got your 10 day forecast, and you can find it as always free in your app store by searching WDIV. Guys? All right, Ben, latest on the coronavirus now. The state's uh, case by case count. Yeah, the state reports 1,271 new cases in the last 24 hours. And sadly, we've lost 83 Michiganders, including 27 from a review of vital records. The state's seven day moving average for daily cases was 1,644 on Monday, the lowest in several weeks. And then on the vaccine front, 56.5% of all Michigan adults have received at least one vaccine dose. 49% of 16 years of age and older are considered fully vaccinated. Of course, younger folks are now eligible as well. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky says more than 4 million teenagers between the ages of 12 to 17 have received their first dose of the vaccine. That includes more than 600,000 who received their first dose of Pfizer vaccine in the past week. Walensky says the latest numbers show 
dramatic progress. The past week has been a big week with progress and milestones that set us on a path out of this pandemic. We should all have cautious optimism. Cases have continued to decrease and have not been this low since spring of last year. Hospital admissions are down, deaths are down, and we are vaccinating between 1.5 million and 2 million people per day. As for even younger children, today Dr. Anthony Fauci predicted that all children will be able to get vaccinated either by the end of this year or in the first quarter of 2022. Michigan legislators give final approval to a bill that would allow more people to attend high school commencements. The bill would exempt high school graduation ceremonies from a state order that restricts crowd sizes due to the coronavirus pandemic. The measure passed 22 to 13 in the Michigan Senate with all Republicans and two Democrats in support. It could be vetoed by Governor Whitmer. We'll of course keep you posted. A Canton father learns his sentence in the shooting death of his son. 33 year old Nicholas Bennett pleaded guilty last month to carelessly discharging his weapon. A shooting that happened last December at a home on Old Michigan Avenue. Prosecutors say Bennett was working on a rifle when he shot his eight year old son who was in the room with him. The boy was rushed to the hospital but did not survive. A charge of involuntary manslaughter was dismissed. He was sentenced to three years probation. More to come here on Local 4 News at 6. Here's Sean Lake. Was Governor Whitmer's flight to Florida an illegal charter flight? Why the FAA is extremely serious about people who own airplanes and run illegal charters. 